Okay, good morning everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Let's talk about uh, a subject we all love, evolutionary robotics. Uh, assignments, undergrads, you're tackling uh, assignment five this week. Uh, midway through these assignments, you're going to be uh, pausing and refactoring uh, your code. You're starting to develop a pretty considerable code base. You're not alone if you're sort of forgetting where various pieces and variables and functions are in the code base. So you're going to spend some time refactoring your code into a more rational structure in assignment five in preparation for six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, where you're going to be gradually wrapping your code base in more and more powerful search methods, evolutionary algorithms. And then in the 10th and final assignment, which the graduate students are going to be tackling this week, you're going to be throwing away this minimal robot that we've been working with so far, which is about as simple a robot as you can make, where you can actually evolve locomotion for it. You're going to throw it away and make a more complicated uh, quadruped in the 10th and final assignment. Grad students, obviously, uh, this time next week, you will have finished all 10 uh, assignments. And I'll give the grad students marching orders uh, Tuesday morning about how to get started on your final projects. And then obviously I'll do the same for all the undergrads five weeks after that. All good? Questions about the assignments? Oh, so uh, in the refactoring, uh, in, in the refactoring instructions in assignment five, you're going to be basically making your uh, code more object oriented. You're developing a larger and larger code base. For some of you, this might be the largest piece of code you've ever worked with. Object-oriented programming, hopefully most of you are somewhat familiar with that concept. It's there to modularize your code, make it easy to add more and more functionality, make it easier at the end of assignment 10 to change things around uh, to conduct whatever final project you want. So if you're not familiar with, or you're a little bit hazy with object-oriented uh, programming concepts, I would suggest before you tackle assignment five, Go find an online tutorial on object-oriented programming in Python. Work your way quickly through that tutorial, then tackle assignment five. Yep. All good? OK. A couple other items about the, uh, pro, uh, about the assignments. A couple updates to the LunoBots instructions. Um, we're going to talk about this now. I'm recording the video, so you don't need to remember all the details. You can go back and have a look at the video. Uh, a student from Northwestern who's also taking the LudoBots course found this particular, uh, found a particular hack where you can remove all those debug windows at the left-hand side of your graphics window. Mm -hmm. Apparently that greatly speeds up uh, the heads-up simulation. So for some of you that have an older laptop, you might find that your simulation runs really, really slowly. So go have a look at step 19 in the simulation uh, module and you can give it a try. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, please email me and let me know whether it worked and what your platform is. Um, this is a new discovery, so I want to see sort of how this helps helps folks. It's, it only helps with the graphics. It obviously doesn't speed up the simulation when you turn the graphics off. Yeah. Uh, a maybe more important typo is in the motors uh, module. Uh, a couple of you stumbled over this. My apologies. In step seven, there used to be two references to robot. Those should be robot ID. Yeah. If you remember step seven, I'm sure you all remember step seven, you're uh, telling, you're, you're adding a motor to the robot. You need to tell the physics engine which robot you're attaching the motor to. Obviously at the moment, most of you only have one robot in your simulation, but if you have a robot swarm, obviously you can add sensors and motors to different robots. When you read in that robot file from the URDF file, it gives you back an integer, which is the name of the robot, the robot's ID. So you're supposed to be passing that integer, which is stored in robot ID, to the physics engine so it knows which robot to add the motor to. All good? Just a little clarification there. Okay, so, uh, sorry, back to the schedule for a moment just to orient you where we are and where we're going. We're working our way through the admittedly brief history of evolutionary robotics. Last week we looked at the, very, the first two experiments and we're now looking at sort of two branches that have grown uh, in evolutionary robotics. One focuses on minimal cognition. What is the simplest robot body and brain we can make where we can evolve various building blocks of 
uh, cognition into that robot. You've all heard of neuroscience, the study of the brain. There is a sister discipline to neuroscience called cognitive science, which is a little bit more theoretic, and, look, and thinks about what are all the sort of cognitive building blocks? What are all the things we learn as children that we then cobble together to tackle more complicated cognitive uh, behaviors? In minimal cognition, that, that subfield is working their way through all of these building blocks from cognitive science uh, and trying to evolve them into robots. And we're going to look at four of those building blocks. We're going to look at four of those building blocks when we get to lecture nine about halfway through today's uh, lecture. Uh, on Thursday and next week, we'll get to uh, the other branch of evolutionary robotics, which focuses on a maybe non-intuitive building block of cognition, which is locomotion. Yeah? Okay. All right, so back to lecture eight. We were looking at a particular type. We were looking at a particular type of neural network, which is used uh, in the minimal cognition experiments. It's a little bit odd because this is not a minimal neural network but it minimally captures a lot of important biological details about brains, about neuro biological neurons and synapses that are not found in traditional neural networks. Yeah? We looked at one of those biological details last time, which is represented by this term here, which tells us that the rate of change of the ith neuron in a CTRNN does what? How does this rate of change change over time. Gets closer, Gets closer to zero, right? Neurons, biological neurons are energy hogs. When they're not quote un, when they're not needed, quote unquote, they tend to relax back to a minimal metabolic state. They're not doing anything, they're resting, they're sleeping. Same thing with neurons in a CTRNN. We introduced another biological detail from last time, which is the time constant. And remember, as we build up this differential equation, to pay attention to the subscripts here, these are the single subscript sub i here is reminding us that each neuron in the CTRNN has its own time constant. Tau sub i is a single number, which represents the time constant of the ith neuron. If we go to some other neuron in the CTRNN, neuron J, that neuron has another number associated with it, tau sub J, which is its time constant. What do different time constants do to the behavior of individual neurons? They change the, way that they, go to they change the rate at which they relax back to zero, right? The Woody Allen and the Eeyore neuron. They either react quickly to things that are happening, or they, they either react quickly or they react slowly. Yeah? <coughs> I think we ended last time by adding in this summation on the right-hand side of our differential equation, which is going to sum over all of the incoming connections to the ith neuron. And in all CTRNNs, every neuron is connected to every other neuron. So we're going to sum over one through uh, uppercase N inclusive, where uppercase N is the number of neurons in the CTRNN. Yeah? We're going to, at every point in time, we're going to take the, we're going to take, uh, the value of the jth neuron. We're going to visit each neuron in turn, take the current value of that neuron, multiply it by the weight of the synapse that connects the jth neuron to the ith neuron, add that to the raw sum, and sum all that up. Yeah? We haven't added the activation function like we saw when we talked about neural networks before. We're just dealing with the raw sum for a moment. Think about the ith neuron at a given point in time and imagine that this whole raw sum comes out to a positive number. How does that influence the rate of change of the ith neuron at that time? If all of the other neurons are influ collectively influencing the ith neuron, they're exciting that neuron. This is a positive number. How does that change the behavior of this neuron? It stops relaxing back towards zero and it gets excited, right? So whatever it is, the rate of change is now more positive. We haven't said what the val current value of y sub i is or what the tau sub i is, but generally speaking, the influence of this term, if it's positive, is to try and increase the rate of change, cause this value, cause the value of y sub i to 
increase in magnitude. Yeah? If this raw sum is inhibitory, if this, if this raw sum comes out to a negative number, how does that influence the behavior of the neuron? Imagine y sub i is 0 at this point in time to make our lives easier. And imagine the time constant is 1 also to make our lives easier. In that case, this differential equation becomes y prime equals a negative number. What does the neuron do? Towards or past 0. Towards or past 0. It could, be, it could already be a negative number. y sub i might be negative. And if this raw sum is negative, it's just pushing it down to be more negative, yeah? So as we complicate this differential equation, these different terms are pushing and pulling, not on the value of y sub i, but they're pushing and pulling on the way in which y sub i changes, right? y sub i prime, yeah? d y sub i divided by dt, if you like. So far, so good? Okay, obviously it gets harder to sort of figure this out in our heads because we've got a lot of these different terms influencing one another. So to build up an intuition for what each of these individual terms is doing, it's useful to mentally get rid of the others, like setting this to zero, setting this to one, and so on. Yeah. We could Im mentally imagine that the weights of all the synapses arriving at the ith neuron are zero. If that's true, if all the weights arriving at the ith neuron are zero, doesn't matter what the values of all the other neurons are, this term is going to have no influence on the rate of change of y sub i. All good? All right, deep breath, let's keep going. This we've seen before, the sigma function, the activation function. Remember, the activation function takes a value and squashes it back within some desired range. When we talked about neural networks a few weeks ago, we talked about the fact that uh, there are different kinds of activation functions that squash the value to different ranges. In C tier and Ns, they tend to use uh, tan H, the hyperbolic uh, tangent, which I'm sure you'll all remember from high school uh, algebra squashes the value to a value between minus 1 and plus 1. Yeah. OK, so that hopefully is somewhat familiar. What's unfamiliar is uh, the activation function is inside the summation term. The way we saw this before, when we saw it before, the activation function was outside the summation term, which means we take the raw sum the value of the presynaptic neuron times the weight plus the other presynaptic neuron times the weight. We took that weighted sum, we calculated that, and then we pushed it through an activation function to get a value back between, minus, or between whatever the de desired range is. In this case, the activation function is sitting inside, which seems a little strange. Anybody have any idea why it's inside here? So normally we're pruning neurons in a network, but here it's a fully connected, connected network, so we're more interested in pruning individual connections. It, it could be. It could have to do with the fully connectedness of, of the neural network. Other ideas? A different activation function? It's a, it is a different activation function from what we've seen. Oh, and then um, each neuron might have a different activation function. Great point. So in theory, every neuron could have its own activation function. In all of the CTRNNs we're going to look at in this and the next lecture, they don't. They all have 10H. And you'll notice that there is no subscript underneath uh, sigma here. Yeah? So remember, the subscripts are our guide to remember who's got what. Right? So every neuron has its, own has its own time constant. And the double subscripts under W remind us that that refers the double subscripts refer to two different neurons, the ith and the jth neuron. Sigma has no subscript, which means it's the same for all the neurons in the CTRNN. We don't want it to be negative. Um, like, like if the... Yeah, it's okay. Take your time. In a normal neural network, would we potentially, because of the structure of it, we'd be applying the activation function in like the prior layer? Uh, we, right, there's layers in a traditional neural network. There's no layers here. Everything is fully connected. 
Um, more specifically, what I was saying, we don't want to like apply the um, activation function after because the weights could be like a lot bigger. Yeah, the weights could be a lot bigger, yes. The main difference between the C tier and N, the main difference between the C tier and N and traditional neural networks, which we talked about, remember is that we're describing mathematically the way in which the neurons change, not the, not the value itself. That's the clue. If we're squashing the outside, we're squashing the rate of, we're trying to squash the rate of change of Y sub I for the rate of change to be between minus one and plus one. Turns out in C tier and N's, we don't care how fast or slow the value of the neuron changes. The rate of change can be as, as positive or as largely negative as we want. What we do want to ensure is that the value itself, the value of the neuron, is between, in this case, minus one and plus one. So we're bringing, we're bringing the activation inside to build a tighter cage around Y sub I. The moment that the Jth neuron tries to exert an influence on the Ith neuron, the minute Y sub J, y sub J speaks, the minute it's sending out a value that we're going to multiply by the connection between j and i, we squash it to a value between minus one. Yeah. So the, a way you can think about this is there's no bound on the rate of change, the speed at which the neurons change value. Inside the neuron itself, we're also not applying the activation function. So inside the neuron, it may have an arbitrarily really, really positive or an arbitrarily really, really big negative number. The moment that we squash the value is the moment the neuron tries to influence something else. That's sort of the intuition for why the activation function is inside the summation term. So like a neuron's value doesn't have to be within that range. It just does when it's influencing another neuron. Yeah, exactly. The moment it's so you can scream as loud as you want in your head, but the moment you actually speak, please keep your volume within a certain range. Another way to think about this. Yeah. So it's hard to control rates of change and internal things. The only thing we really care about is the moment that the, the neuron is trying to influence stuff out there. We want to keep values within some certain range. Does the like the first negative yi term? Does that also kind of factor in with like keeping ah. the the actual like activation under control instead of also using the activation function? Yeah, great question. So obviously the differential equation here says nothing about initial values. You remember when we were working at the board last lecture, we had to choose an initial value for, what, for y sub i. We had to choose an initial value for the neuron. We could put some additional constraint, which doesn't show up in the, in the math here, on the initial values. We could also say the initial values must be between plus 1 and minus 1. It's kind of implicit in the experiments we're going to see, but I think, yes, I think they also keep the initial values within minus 1 and plus 1. So far, so good? OK, let's keep going. All right, a new variable we haven't seen before, the gain of the neuron J. Again, we have a single subscript, so that reminds us that every neuron in the C tier and N has its own gain value. Whatever this value is, it could be a positive or negative number, we're multiplying it by the current value of the Jth neuron. So this seems a little odd. So the Y sub J speaks, we output its value, we multiply it by this gain value, and then squash that the result of that multiplication. What is if a, if a if the jth neuron in a CTRNN has a gain of zero, what does that do? It kills the neuron, right? No matter what the values of the weights of the synapses that are leaving Y sub J, no matter how positive or how negative in magnitude those weights are. We've basically shut off the voice of Y sub J if we set its gain to zero. If we tune up the gain to a very large number, what is that doing? 
Makes it have more of an effect on you. Ha makes it have more of an effect on whatever it connects to. So, uh, someone a few minutes ago mentioned pruning the neural network, right? So in a CTRNN, every neuron is connected to every other neuron. This is exceedingly a dense neural network. This is definitely not how nervous systems are wired up, especially not, uh, especially not human neural systems. So you have about 10 to the 11 neurons, and you have about 10 to the 14 synapses. So in your head and in your spine and most of the rest of your body, for every neuron, it connects on average to about 10,000 other neurons. 10,000 is a vanishingly small fraction of 10 to the 11, the total number of neurons that you have. Yeah? So biological nervous systems, no matter how big they are, and ours are pretty big by the number of neurons, they tend to be relatively sparse. Each neuron communicates with relatively few others. The billion dollar question in AI still remains, which, which neuron should be connected to which other ones? Here, by creating this new variable, uh, the, the gain variable, as, as you might have already guessed, we're gonna place all of these variables, all, sorry, all of these parameters, not the variables, the variables are the neurons themselves. We're gonna place all of the parameters under evolutionary control. And evolution is gonna try and set all the tau's, all the w's, and all the g's. I'm a, so when I look at that, I, it feels to me like the WJIs, like the, the synap synaptic weights, could essentially evolve for like to kind of cover the gain. Is that exactly. is the gain kind of a shortcut, or is it like is the gain kind of a shortcut? So the w's and the g's are kind of redundant, right? If evolution wants to shut up neuron J, it could do so by mutating all of the outgoing synapses from J. It could mutate them all down towards zero. Assuming for whatever it is you want the robot to do, it's useful to shut off J. The gain is a shortcut. With one mutation, if a mutation hits G sub J, and that mutation by chance happens to bring that parameter down very close to zero. With one mutation, it's basically removed the influence. It's basically removed the J neuron from the CTRNN altogether. Yeah. Question. So the game like lets you turn neurons on and off. It lets you turn neurons on and off. Exactly. Yeah. It's not an integer, it's a floating point value, so it's more or less about sort of tuning the overall influence, but yes, one other thing it can do, evolution can do, is use it to shut neurons on and off. Yeah. This is a concept that comes up uh, a lot in theoretical evolutionary biology, is there may be some phenotype, there may be some body shape and behavior that is useful for a given species that that species hasn't discovered yet, but if, in order to obtain or achieve that phenotype, that useful way of being, if it takes a thousand mutations to get there, evolution might not find it, right? If you've got to get all the pieces in place in order for it to work, it's no good, right? So what you'll often see in evolutionary robotics and evolutionary algorithms is the human investigators trying to give evolution lots of different options, different ways to get to different good solutions. Of course, we, the human investigators, don't know what the good solutions are. We're just trying to give evolution lots of options. If it's useful to turn on and off certain neurons, we don't want to make it have to put together a whole bunch of mutations in order to get there. The probability that all those mutations would happen to set all those synaptic weights near zero, the probability of that happening is close to zero. Yeah? It is indeed sort of a shortcut. Assuming that's useful. All good? Question. So like the, the W's are kind of like fine-tuning, whereas the G is just kind of like uh, tuning? They're not quite the same. G and W are not quite the same. It might be useful to tune a specific weight, one synapse in the neural network. It's important for this particular neuron to have this kind of influence on the ith neuron, right? So evolution, again, through mutations, might play with that individual weight yeah, 
There may be other situations where it's not so specific. It's not about the influence of this neuron on that neuron. It's this neuron in particular is, we need, we need to get rid of it. Or alternatively, whatever this neuron is computing, this value is actually useful for a lot of the other neurons. So let's increase the volume. Let's increase the gain of that neuron. Again, this is just an intuition. Remember, we have if we have uppercase n neurons, we have uppercase n differential equations describing all the neurons in that CTRNN. And all of these situations are going on in parallel. It's useful for this neuron to be doing this, useful for that neuron to be doing this, this influence should be that, this influence should be that, and so on. Okay? Just giving evolution the option to try and find those useful combinations. All good? Okay, let's keep going. Another set of parameters, the bias. You'll notice again we have a single subscript, which reminds us that every neuron in the CTRNN has its own bias. What is the bias for? Or what does the bias do? Absolutely, it's exactly what you said. It's modifying the value that y sub, uh, sorry, the jth neuron sends out. It's modifying it always by a constant value. If, if theta sub j is positive, that means whatever value is coming out of y sub j, we're always adding a little bit to it. If theta is negative, we're always subtracting a small amount or a large amount from the value of uh, of the JF neuron. Question? Is it, is it similar to just like an offset? It is an, it is an offset, yeah, exactly. Bias, offset, same thing. We're allowing evolution to set some constant offset to the output of the JF neuron. How big do we usually need to, like what, what values of that are we looking at? What values of, of n are we looking at? Yeah. We're going to look, so we're, uh, when we finish this in two slides, we're going to look at an actual experiment, and I think it was several hundred okay. in this case. Yeah, Could be a dozen, could be several hundred. Just because I was, because it looks like there's a lot of parameters, but I guess most of them are in the WJI. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, right. So there's, you can imagine, you can start to figure out for uppercase n how many actual parameters are in the genotype. Remember, that's the blueprint or the description of the solution. There are a lot. And the to within that large number of parameters, most of them are Ws, right? Because we need one for every uh, pair of connected neurons, which is uppercase N squared. Yeah. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, sorry, gain and bias, again, are mathemat these are mathematical uh, attempt, attempts to model biological details of neurons. Uh, the gain it, it corresponds to a biological detail that there certain neurons just are louder than others. When they speak, they just, because of all the biological details of neurons, they tend to influence whoever they're connected to more. They either excite their neighbors more or inhibit their neurons more. They're just louder, they're just more influential. The bias uh, is also uh, matching a biological detail, which is some neurons tend to want to inhibit their neighbors. Even if they're connected by different kinds of synapses, generally speaking, they're trying to turn off their neighbors, shut them, shut them down, their inhibitory connections. Some neurons generally are excitatory. They they're tend to emit positive numbers or they're trying to influence or excite their neighbors. Yeah? Again, this is kind of literally hand wavy, but generally speaking, all, the, all of your 10 to 11 neurons, they have unique personalities. They tend to have certain biases or tendencies. Yeah? Okay, we've got one more turn to add, but let's pause here and, and sort of consolidate all of the biological detail we've added. You'll notice that um, we now have quite a bit of mathematical detail inside the activation function. So we have 
inside the neuron itself, we have Y sub J, its raw value. The moment it tries to speak, whatever the number it's trying to send out along its outgoing synapses, we add or subtract some number to that value, and then we multiply that result by some number, either positive or negative, or near zero, then squash it to a value between minus one and plus one. Yeah? So this term here, everything, in, everything inside and including the activation function itself, for the next two lectures, I want you to just sort of remember that that's the value that's coming out of the neuron. The value that comes out of the neuron is going to be between minus one and plus one. Here's the details of sort of how we're getting that number. Yeah? So at any point in time, we're going to have current values for the neurons between minus one and plus one. And then we're going to have some mathematical description of how they're changing over time. So far, so good? OK, I mentioned that in CTRNNs, every neuron is connected to every other neuron. So this is sort of different from what we typically see when we take neural networks and use them to control robots, which is that we have some neurons as sensor neurons, taking in values from the outside world. We have some neurons which are motor neurons. They're sending values to the motors or to the muscles to cause the robot or the, or the machine or the animal to move. And then we have also these hidden neurons, which are sort of shuttling values from the sensor neurons to the motor neurons. So when we take CTRNNs and use them to control robots, we add an additional term. I hate this notation here. Uppercase I sub lowercase I. I sub I, sorry, I didn't make this up. This value is set to zero if that neuron is not a sensor neuron. So imagine we have a 200 neuron CTRNN. We drop it into a robot that has eight sensors. We arbitrarily choose eight of those 200 neurons and connect those eight neurons to the eight sensors. And now, when we start to run a robot at every time step, we set those eight chosen neurons, we set I sub I to the value of the ith uh, sensor. Yeah? So eight of the differential equations are going to have a non-zero term here. And all the other 192 neurons in this 200 neuron CTRNN, we're going to just set this to zero. So this is our way of sort of plugging these neurons into the sensors of the robot. Would we ever mutate during evolution which neuron is a sensor neuron, or is that too original? That's a great question. We could. In this case, we're going to treat I sub I as a variable. It's not something we have control over or evolution has control over. It's being set by the sensors themselves. The sensors have control over these variables. We are also not setting the Y sub I's. The values of the Y sub I's are being set according to these differential equations. So in this equation here, we have a mixture of variables. Variable, 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 variable. And a set of parameters, tau, the tau, the w's, the g's, and the thetas. Yeah? So a little bit more terminology for us. Whenever we talk about a parameter, that's something that either the human investigators are setting, because maybe we have an intuition about what those parameters should be, or if we don't have an intuition, we turn over those parameters to the evolutionary algorithm and let it figure out those parameters. Whatever those value parameters are set to, they influence how the variables change when the robot actually does its thing. So far, so good? Yeah, so we wanted to, um, like, for the reason why we had the activation function around Y was that we wanted to, like, squash out the source. Like, um, why do we have the G, the, the gain, and the uh, bias inside of that activation function as well? Yeah, exactly. So why is, why is the gain and theta inside the activation function as well? So they're, th these, they're all these are all associated with um, what the neuron is sending out into the world or out to other neurons, yeah? 
So whenever we query the jth neuron, we want it to give us back a value, right? And for the moment, that value is going to go out and influence the other neurons. Once we hook this thing up to a robot, some of the, you probably have guessed, some of these neurons, the values that they output are going to be sent to the motors to get the robot to start moving. Yeah? The motor can only do so much, right? It can only apply so much force, as you're seeing in, uh, as, you'll, as you've seen in assignment four. So we want to just be confident whenever we ask for a value from a neuron that it's always in some range. We, we, can, we expect it to be inside some range, which for us is going to be minus one and plus one. But again, we still want those neurons to have their own, individual neurons to have their own personality. So we put that in before we take the activation function. So the get large positive gains mean that that neuron is going to typically output a value that's near plus one. A large negative gain means this neuron is going to shout near minus one, but never below minus 0.1, no matter how big the value of the gain is. Make sense? So when we start evolving these parameters, like for example, evolving the gains, mutations might start setting the gain to be larger and larger and larger, 10,000, 10 million, 10 trillion. It's really, it's cranking up the gain to the maximum possible value for a neuron, but the neuron itself only ever shouts at something approaching plus one. Yeah, we can be confident in that. We're never gonna query we're never going to get a value back from a neuron and it's plus 10,000 and we send 10,000 to the, to the motor, the motor spins and breaks. Yeah? We're ultimately sending the, the values from this neural network into the real world and there's only so much that can happen in the real world. Make sense? So this is how to combine confidence in what a neuron is going to output plus allowing it to have its own individual personality. That's why gain and theta are inside the activation function. Make sense? OK. All right, thanks for your patience through all the math. Now let's get to the fun part. OK. We're going to see uh, an experiment here. This is, a re this is probably the most complicated evolution and robotics experiment we're going to see in this class. You can ignore most of the details. For the grad students, I would recommend you, re it's, this is optional reading for this lecture, I'd recommend you go into some of the details of this experiment. Uh, you're gonna see in this experiment how they, how they exploit some of the unique features of CTRNNs, features that don't exist in traditional neural networks, to get a robot to exhibit useful behavior in the real world, yeah? What is that useful behavior? You're going, this is one of the few robots we're going to see in this class where it's going to learn to do not just one thing, it's going to learn to do multiple things and then chain those things together in different sequences. This is their poor little humanoid robot here trying to learn. Let me skip ahead a little bit. This is the human demonstrator demonstrating to the robot a motor primitive. It's a simple, short action. Here's the robot demonstrating that it's learned this motor primitive, this very simple, short action, to shake the block up and down three times. Sorry. Here's the robot learning a different motor primitive. Shake the block left and right three times.
and then combining these motor primitives together. So this is one important building block of uh, intelligence, which is often overlooked, which is compositionality. You are able to do so many different things reliably, not because you've learned every individual behavior on its own. You didn't learn how to walk to this particular lecture hall and then learn how to walk to that particular lecture hall. You are able to walk to this particular lecture hall by putting together in, unique, in new combinations motor primitives that you learned decades ago. What are those motor primitives? Walking. Walking is in turn made up of primitives, which are, I know you don't remember, but walking is tricky. Balance, individual steps, one step forward, catch your balance, one step back, catch your balance, take another step, turn left, turn right, turn left, then turn right, walk counterclockwise, walk counterclockwise, walk clockwise. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it when you think back on it. It seems like you learned walking. That's it, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Walking is actually a composite of a lot of simpler motor primitives, yeah? I don't know how many of you remember the ancient art of longhand, right? That is also made up of a bunch of motor primitives, yeah? Longhand, it is a behavior, but it is also a composite of simpler behaviors. Like what? I have to remember back to grade three, grade two. Yeah, what is longhand? Oh, gosh. Cursive. cursive, thank you. Yes, cursive. Thank you. How did you learn cursive? Like, there's like kind of a set of strokes. So there's a set of strokes. Motor, you just like go up, then you make like this. This, 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 this. Those are motor primitives, which in turn, making a stroke is made up of more motor primitives. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Now you've got to go back even further. I have a year, year and a half year old son at home. He's getting the first of these. He's not, at, he's not at strokes yet or cursive. He's learning the motor primitives that make up strokes. In, in like the, the neural networks, because I know with like a um, convolution network, sometimes you get, at least when it's analyzing images, you get almost like the, the filters will train on very small, like easy patterns. Is that kind of a similar? Very analogy? similar. Like, Yep. You'd have like a very basic motor primitive, and then it kind of starts to combine them into one more complex one. Absolutely. So those of you that know anything about deep learning, we mentioned this when we were talking about our history of AI. When a deep, lear when a deep learner learns to recognize cats and dogs in images, it's towards the output layer that it's able to recognize cats and dogs. A little bit upstream towards the input layer where you put in the raw pixel values, it recognizes parts of cat faces and dog faces. If you go even closer to the input layer, it recognizes diagonal lines or vertical lines in a very small uh, spatial area. It's learning visual primitives to recognize lines, dots, uh, black surrounded by white, and then composing those visual primitives together to learn that a cat face is made up of those small visual primitives in this way, and a dog face is made up of visual primitives in this other way, yeah? People in embodied cognition pull their hair out about deep learners because they're learning, they're throwing out the motor part, yeah? Human infants don't sit quietly all the time and learn visual primitives, they learn motor primitives. What are the motor primitives that make up the ability to take a pen and draw a straight line with it. Someone just did it in the back of the room, yeah? This, not this, not this, not this, not this, not, not so good. Oh, this, I am reliably producing now a visual primitive, which is a straight line. Aha, uh -huh, I can do this, I can do this on here, I can do this. Now I'm ready to start composing those primitives together into drawing horizontal lines, vertical lines, diagonal lines, cursive, code, onward and onward, yeah? Okay, so you saw some snippets in this video of the robot starting to learn these motor primitives. This robot is being controlled by a CTRNN. 
it's a uh, it's a here's our here's our uh, here's our differential equation here describing the C tier and N. Inside this robot, it has a whole bunch of uh, neurons, each one described by this differential equation. As you saw, it's going to learn to do a bunch of motor primitives, like start in the home position. Sorry, this is going to be hard to read in the back of the room. Start at the home position and reach for the object. Stop when both your hands are touching either side of the block. That's a motor primitive, being able to do that reliably or touch with one hand, clap hands. Here are three different motor primitives that it can execute once it's got its hands on the block. It can rotate the block up and down three times, or left and right three times, or forward and back three times. What you're going to see in this experiment is the, the experimenters are going to teach it all of these motor primitives, and then ask it to compose those motor primitives in unique combinations. So the, after training, after the robot has learned, the investigator is going to ask the robot, lift the block up and down three times, then left and right three times, then up and down three times again, then forward and back three times, then go back to the home position. And the robot, as you're going to see, is able to do that. Yeah? There's different ways in which they could teach the robot different motor primitives in such a way that it'll be able to, after training, compose those motor primitives together in different ways. The more, for most people, the most intuitive way to do this is to isolate a subset of neurons and train those neurons to produce a particular pattern that when they are connected to the motors in the robot, the robot shakes the block, uh, shakes the block up and down three times. Let's assume green is up and down three times. Then, when we continue training it to move the block left and right uh, three times, we're going to identify a subset of neurons and say, you neurons, when you're allowed to control the motors, you should cause the robot to do this. And then finally, this set of sub subset of neurons, when you're connected to the motors, you're going to uh, move the block backwards and forwards three times. So basically, there's a bunch of different things we want the robot to do. In this cartoon example here, three different things, green, blue, and red. We're going to train different parts of the robot's brain to cause the robot to do those behaviors. Then, when we ask the robot to put these motor, compose these motor primitives together in different ways, we can turn on and off these different gates. These gates are basically connect things that allow the neurons to influence the motors or not, to shut it off. Where have we seen that idea before? The robot can basically think different thoughts. It can think about shaking the block left and right or up and down. When we tell it left and right, imagination becomes reality. That thought in its head connects to the motors and it actually does that action. We talked about a robot that, left to its own devices, it'll just wander around. But if suddenly something starts to approach it from the right, it'll switch behavior. Some other behavior grabs hold of the motors, which causes it to move away from the oncoming object. At the moment, it doesn't sense anything nearby. That, part, that behavior lets go of the motors, and the robot goes back to wandering at random over the carpeted floor. Where did we see this idea before? It's the Roomba, which is controlled by the subsumption architecture. Different behaviors can subsume. They can push all other parts of the brain out of the way and grab hold of the motors because those neurons know something imminent. There's an imminent danger or maybe an imminent opportunity, and they should be in control of the, of the motors. Yeah? The investigators say, now shake the block up and down. The up and down neurons say, oh, we know what to do, we know what to do, let us control the motors. This is one way we could build the brain for the robot to allow it to do this, to compose motor primitives together. Hopefully it's intuitive. There's some, we have left out some of the neural details about how we would actually set the tails and the Ws and the Gs to do this. 
But there's ways we could do that. But there's a problem with this solution. The benefit is that us puny humans can understand it, but it's got a drawback. You only let it do one thing at a time, the constitutionality would suffer? Uh, maybe. We're in, in the act, what the investigators actually did is not this. They did something else. But we're always going to assume it's just one action after another. So we're, gonna com we're just going to consider composition sequentially, just composed sequentially. Do this then do this, then do this. Yeah. If you want to draw a Z, do a horizontal stroke, then a diagonal stroke, then another horizontal stroke. You're composing motor primitives together sequentially. You can't, like, you couldn't teach us to do, like, oblong circuits or something like uh, that, right? Right, so you, we couldn't compose them in parallel. Yeah. We'll just set that aside for today. That's, that's even harder. We're going to just focus on sequential composition today. What's the drawback of isolating different parts of the brain to execute different behaviors? If we put you in a brain scanner and we asked you to not move, but imagine picking up a pen with your left hand, then imagine picking up a pen with your right hand, then imagine yourself walking, imagine yourself jumping, imagine yourself running. We could ask you to visualize the hundreds or thousands of motor primitives, which you know how to do, and it turns out that for those thousand different things we ask you to imagine, it's not that a thousand different parts of your brain lights up. Whatever brains are doing, it's not this. Why not? Because you'd have to like essentially relearn all the motor privileges for each of your different actions. Uh, you might have to relearn. It, this might not generalize very well. Maybe that's the, right to, to new circumstances. Again, let's put that detail aside takes up a lot of space, right? Your brain is soaking up 20% of all the calories that you ingest, right? The brain is an energy hog, so we, we want to actually have as few neurons as possible. The fact that we have 10 to the 11, they're, they're doing a lot of work. You want to make good use of neural real estate. You know how to do tens of thousands, maybe millions of motor primitives. We don't want to, when you learn them, we don't want to encode them in unique different parts of the brain. There just isn't enough room in your head. So however Mother Nature figured this out, it's some form of superposition, meaning that uh, neurons are not responsible for an individual primitive. They contribute differently to different motor primitives. Yeah? How would this work? Nobody knows, but in this experiment, they came up with a hypothesis for how it might work built it into a robot to see if that would allow a robot to compose motor primitives together. And we wouldn't be talking about it, this experiment if it didn't work. It works. Here's how they did it. They, uh, they have a CTRNN. Every neuron is connected to every other neuron. The investigators went in and manually set the tau values themselves. And they let evolution set all the Ws, Gs, and thetas. They set the, t the time constants on some of the neurons to be Woody Allen neurons, that they would change. They're very sensitive. They would change their values very quickly. They set the time constants on some of the other neurons to be uh, very large values, so that those neurons, however they change their values, they always change their values slower. So far, so good. They then evolved this neural network so that when the slow neurons were at a particular set of values, those slow neurons would push the fast neurons into a particular pattern, the red pattern. When the slow neurons changed to some other set of values, they pushed the same fast neurons into a different pattern, the green pattern. When the slow neurons changed their values to some other set of values again, slowly, they pushed the fast neurons, same fast neurons again, into a third different pattern over time. Yeah. These fast neurons, all of them are always connected to the motors. 
There isn't s different subsets of neurons grabbing and releasing the motors. The fast units always have control of the motors, and those fast neurons in turn are being controlled by the slow, slowly changing neurons. Questions? The metaphor here is an orchestra. You have a whole bunch of different musicians. They're all playing all the time. They're all, they're all contributing to the overall signal, the music. The conductor is the slow neuron, or neurons, yeah? The conductor is pushing the musicians into a particular pattern and holding the musicians there for a while until the conductor pushes all of the musicians into some other unique, consistent pattern. Everybody see that? It's less intuitive because we have multiple motor primitives that are being printed or imprinted onto the same set of fast neurons. So we give up intuition here. We don't, it's very difficult to know how to set the W's and G's and y, uh, the G's and thetas to make that happen. We're going to turn that over to evolution. Let it do it. What we're giving evolution is certain raw material. We're saying, OK, evolution, these neurons are fast. These are slow. Have at it. We want you to do this. So far, so good? All right, so we've given up intuition. What do we get in return? Why are we going this extra step? Why are we making things so hard on ourselves, and possibly hard on the evolutionary algorithm? It's a lot more efficient. It's a lot more efficient. We can pack three motor primitives into this set of neurons. Maybe we can pack four in there, maybe 10, maybe 100. Who knows? All right. Much more detail on this slide. You can ignore most of the detail here. I want you to just sort of look at this picture from a distance. Everything is, uh, everything is more or less connected to everything else. They put some dashed lines around subsets. This is just a visual reminder that some of these neurons are changing their values fast. These neurons all in here, they have a fast uh, they're, they're changing relatively quickly. The investigators set these fast neurons. Or, I'm sorry, let's go down here. These neurons in the middle are fast. They have a tau of five. These neurons over here are the slow ones. They have a tau of 70. How the researchers here came up with five and 70, I have no idea. They probably tried different combinations until things worked. The important thing is that these tau values are much higher than these tau values. Yeah. This, set of motor, uh, this set of neurons over here, you can see they're called input-output neurons. So these neurons over here, they all have the I sub I term attached to them. All of these neurons, whatever sensors are on the robot, it doesn't matter for our purposes what those sensors are, these neurons are all getting values from the outside world. And at the same time, whatever their, their outgoing value is, their squashed value between minus one and plus one, they're also sending values to the robot's motors, causing the robot's hinge joints to start moving. So these two groups back here, these are hidden neurons. They're sheltered from the world. These are in direct contact with the world. Receiving sensation, sending out actions. Yeah? It's put together quite differently from the neural networks we've seen so far. Questions? What's the goal arrow? Aha, I left that for last. What is the goal arrow here? As the robot is performing, as these neurons are influencing the motors, there is a single integer that the humans are putting in from outside. So you can actually think about one of the neurons in here as, as an ear, and they can hear the researchers saying something. The researchers aren't speaking English. They're just supplying an integer value. One, three, two, five. What do you think those integers are meant to represent? The different primitives. The different primitives, yeah? Home position, one. Then suddenly that goal integer changes to two, which is the investigator saying, reach for the object. 
So here's the conductor down here, the slow neurons. The conductor, him or herself, is reading sheet music, which you can think of as the goal. The conductor knows what, it, what, it, what the orchestra is supposed to be doing. What song or what melody are they supposed to be playing? Yeah? Question? How do you evaluate fitness with this kind of complex? Great, great question. I'm kind of leaving that detail uh, out, but generally speaking, you, you remember in the video that we saw the teacher actually moving the arms of the robot? As the researcher was moving the robot's arms, these neurons were getting particular sensor values in. So, and at the same time, the number two was actually being input along the goal signal. So the slow neurons were hearing this, and the fast, the input-output neurons were feeling these changes in its joints. So the investigator is basically saying these two things should happen together. During evolution, evolution has to figure out how to set the W's, G's, and thetas so that when this shows up again, this particular pattern of sensor values should arise. The pattern that the robot felt when the robot was being moved through the primitive by the teacher. Make sense? That's what all this sensory feedback and teaching signal over here means. Details of that, not so important for our purposes today. Okay, let's finish up by looking at uh, the result of an evolved neural network. So uh, up here on the horizontal axis, this is the goal signal. So at this point in time, the, uh, the researcher is saying reach for the block. Then they're saying up and down three times. This is the integer going in. Then the integer changes, which is meant to represent left and right three times. Then, back, uh, then a different integer meant to tell the robot to go back to the home position. Yeah? Reach, up and down three times, left and right three times, back to home. Over that time period, these are the values. Uh, these are the values. Actually, let's skip ahead to these here. Forget about the teaching signal. This is what the robot felt when it heard that goal signal. And you can see that there's three bumps here and three bumps here, three, uh, three bumps in its vision and three bumps in its vision as well. So whatever the robot is doing, it's repeating something three times. Looking, it's looking good. Uh, you can go back and watch the video, but this is the robot actually succeeding at what they were asked to do. When the investigator says, shake the block up and down three times, the robot actually shook the block up and down three times. So far, so good? Okay, so the, these are uh, these are the robot's uh, sensors and motor values. Let's dive inside the robot's brain at that time. The particular, uh, the particular neural network that made up this robot, there were a total of 180 neurons. I'm sorry, it's gonna be impossible to read. It's down here in the lower left, 180. Neurons 101 through neurons 160. Those 60 neurons out of the 180, those were the fast neurons. That's the, that's the orchestra. Each row here, each of the 60 rows in this panel corresponds to one of those 60 neurons. Black and white represents what do you think? We're reading out the values of these 60 neurons. High and low values of these neurons. It's this value at every point in time for those 60 neurons. You'll notice if you look at this picture, there are three repetitive patterns in there. So that's good. And those three repetitive patterns, it's synchronized across the 60 neurons. The 60 neurons are doing slightly different versions of whatever this pattern is, but they're all repeating it together. It's all the different instruments playing different notes, but they're all in synchrony and they're all waxing and waning together, yeah? So, so far, so good. The robot is doing the right thing. The fast neurons inside seem to be playing the right tune. 
The most interesting part is in the very lower left here. Maybe let me zoom out here. Uh, let me bring this up and then zoom in so people in the back can see. Okay, here's the slow neurons here. The slow, there's 20 slow neurons, neuron 161 through neuron 180. Uh, and you'll notice that these neurons, the Eeyore neurons, the neurons with the large tau, the large time constant, are changing slowly. At least during this period, they're not repeating themselves three times. They're holding some constant signal, and that's pushing these neurons into a, uh, a repeating pattern three times, which causes the sensors and motors to do this. Yeah? When the goal integer changes, when the number there changes to something else, you'll notice these neurons change slowly into a different pattern. They're kind of repeating a little bit. They're oscillating a bit, but still slowly. They push the other neurons into another repeating pattern. Everybody see that? So this is sort of the equivalent of you when you're telling yourself to walk to class and there's a repeating pattern, walk, 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 step, 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 step. You look, you're running late for class, your internal signal, your goal signal changes from walk to run, and now your repeating pattern changes to something else. You run to class so you're not late. Make sense? So you're seeing here in playback that the robot has not just learned different motor primitives, it's learned how to compose those motor primitives together into different sequences on command. This is after evolution has, figured, has finished up. In theory, you should be able to give this robot an infinite sequence of goals and it just keeps composing those signals together, those primitives together sequentially in different combinations and permutations. Yeah. They taught the robot five or six different motor primitives and they managed to evolve it into a 180 neuron CTRNN. Hopefully most of you are wondering at this point, how many more can you pack in there? Nobody knows. This is a pretty ambitious final project. For some of the grad students, you might consider tackling this. No one's been able to get a good answer to this question yet. It's a big open question. If you're going to try and compose or pack motor primitives together for a robot, how, much, how many primitives can you pack into a given amount of real estate, a given amount of neurons and synapses? OK. Questions about that before we move on? Okay. Question? Do you have like multiple layers of slower? Like, do you extend it out essentially? Exactly, right? So, us puny humans, all we could do is think about slow and fast, the orchestra and the conductor. Not surprisingly, in you, there are neurons that are not just fast or slow, they have a whole gradient, a whole continuum of fast and slow responses. Because many of your behaviors are very, very slow learn evolutionary robotics over the course of a few months to very, very fast, right? Catch the ice ball that your so-called friend threw at you before it hits your head in a tenth of a second, right? We have a huge conti temporal continuum over which we need to respond to threats and opportunities. Neurons have evolved to be fast and slow. Yeah? Whatever the details are in the robot, they're always a, a gross approximation of what really goes on in biological systems. Okay, so let's uh, again put these CTRNNs to work, and uh, let's have a. Uh, we're so in lecture nine here. I love this lecture. We're going to look at some experiments from this particular paper down here. This is kind of like the Robo Olympics. They're going to evolve these robots to do four different uh, building blocks of cognition. We kind of already looked at one composing motor primitives, so you can think about this as the second through the fifth building block we're going to look at. The first of the four is perceiving affordances. When you look out at the world around you, it feels like you recognize objects based on their geometry. If I asked you to tell me what this is, you'd probably say an eraser. 
But I asked you, if I asked you not to give me the name, but just describe this object, you'd probably say it's black, it's a rectangular solid, its length is twice its width and height and so on. You'd give me geometric descriptions of this thing. However, if I gave it to you and asked you to use it, you would obviously do something with it. An idea that came out of psychology is that it feels like we recognize objects by identifying their geometry, but it's turning out in reality that that's not actually what we're doing. When we look at an object, it's not just the visual primitives that matter. Motor primitives start to arise in our mind, which is ideas about what we could do with that object. In the early days of computer vision, back in the 70s and 80s, they tried to teach a robot, uh, they teach a machine to recognize chairs in an image. And they tried to do that by telling the robot, uh, the robot, telling the AI to look for three or maybe four legs, look for a flat surface, maybe look for a back, maybe not. They started, they, it felt like we recognize objects based on geometry, so let's try and give geometry to machines in order to recognize objects. The machines failed completely for decades until deep learning came along. That's not what we do. When you look at these objects, obviously I chose these particular chairs because their geometry is completely different, different right? Give me a geometric description of a chair that covers these objects, right? So it's almost impossible to do. When you look at these objects, these objects afford certain actions to you. They advertise the ways in which you could interact with them, which is they afford, to get taken together, these five very different objects project the same affordance. They suggest to you that if you were to place your weight on them, they would support your weight. Yep. If we showed these five images to 60 foot tall giants, the giants would not see the same affordances we see. When you're looking at an object, you're thinking not just about the object, you're thinking about the, relation, the possible relationships between you and the object. It depends both on the object and you. Most of the time, you're not aware that that's what you're doing. Okay, we can play the affordance game. You can see I've kept one of the objects the same. What's the common affordance among these objects? For these five, four images. Fewer energy potential? They, they, they are fewer energy potential, yeah. But we've let, you left out us, right? It's always about the relationship to us. This is a common bi cognitive bias. We forget that we're part of the equation. They provide energy that we can use to heat our homes or drive our cars, right? Distant stars produce huge amounts of energy, but they wouldn't be included in this group because we don't have a way to use the energy from distant stars, at least not yet, right? What's the common affordance between these two objects? They're different. You can interact with each of these objects in lots and lots of different ways. Each object on its own projects different affordances, different ways it can be used. If I hold them together, there's only a small subset of affordances that are common to these two objects. If I were to put you in a brain scanner right now, and scanned the motor part of your brain. In the motor part of your brain, different parts of the motor strip light up when you think about doing different actions with different parts of your body. Which parts of your motor strip do you think light up when I show you both these objects together? It's not your left foot. It's not your right ear. Arms, more specifically. Hands, right? This, you might, hopefully, most of you thought or imagined something like this, right? Or maybe something like this, something to do with hands and arms, yeah? Okay, that's affordances. How are we doing for time? We're out of time. We'll leave things there for today. We'll continue our Robo Olympics on Thursday. We have a quiz due tonight. 
Undergrads, assignment five. Grads, nine and 10. Have a good day.